tiger on the prowl. I'm going to make it go wild. I'm original, and I told you so. I'm a kid in a candy store with the leather on the dumb. I ain't the cure, I'm the venom. If you want to find me, find the taillights. Something's coming in, you're going to want to take a red eye. It's time to go. It's time to go. Get ready. Welcome, What Up Wednesday, Keely Dunn, FH Umpires, and you are the third team, and thank you for coming. I was feeling the tunes today. You know, sometimes, you know, you hear a song a lot, like your theme song, and you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I should change this up today. No, I was feeling it. We were getting ready. Thanks for being here. And we have a busy, busy show coming up. I see lots of people filing in and... It is absolutely fantastic. Oh, Rush, thanks for coming. Don't see you very often. It's nice to have you as always. I'm a little loud in my own monitors. Okay, here we go. What do you mean you're multitasking? Oh yes, I know. I actually might, I might have Belgium China going on on one of my monitors as, as we go. The thing about the Pro League is that one day you'll turn on a game and from an umpiring perspective, it doesn't feel like there's a ton going on. And then suddenly a game that you don't expect will have anything in it whatsoever. It just blows up and you're just sitting there, Cheetos all over your face, you know, your wine spilled and you're wondering what happened. Okay, that's just me. Good to see everybody. Uh, Niels, good to have you back. I hope you've done all your school and you succeed in all the things. Um, Yurian, I know you, you stopped by the huddle or, uh, a watch party and I was like, Hey, stranger, I'm so glad that people are, uh, it's, it's nice to see people going through the cycles of their seasons and things like that. Like Amanda can't come cause she's going to be off at summer league and there you go. And Vanry is here. Awesome. 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 Okay. Um, let's see. You're watching with COVID. No, COVID has you, but you're not watching with COVID. COVID is not part of the watch party. I disagree, fundamentally. I'm just kidding. Okay, today's show, before we get into it, is brought to you by FH Umpires and the Communication Skills Workshop I just scheduled. Okay, we're gonna go on Thursday, June 16th at uh, 1800 GMT. If you go to fhumpires.com forward slash communication, you will be able to click on the link and you'll get your time and date and get a conversion going. Yes, I will schedule this workshop again in another couple of weeks and I'll do it in a time zone that's better for Australia and you know, that sort of, end of the time zone. So uh, we will be doing that. 
Okay, so there you go. We're gonna talk about all the different ways that you can communicate on the pitch, off the pitch. It'll actually, I think, when I was going through the material and I was doing my research and I was pulling everything together, I really was able to apply this, not just to umpiring, but to lots of other areas of my life. So I think it's gonna be really, really fun. And I've got some really good material because I've been collecting clips of some of my favorites, like, you know, Yaku, because he's one of my favorites. So there you go. I hope you can make it. Um, if you are a Yellow member, you do get a pretty hefty discount. I'm just saying, so if you haven't joined Yellow yet and you're thinking about it and you wanna do this workshop, maybe you should sign up for Yellow first. Okay, I'm just saying. Like, I'm not the boss of you. I'm just trying to give you good life advice. This is what we're doing today, gang. All the topics, woo! We're gonna go through a goalkeeper tap, cut, blah, 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 tackle, dangerous shots. We're gonna talk about a height of the first shot on a penalty corner. I'm gonna show off an air, attempted aerial interception and a free hit taken inside the circle when a goalkeeper loses a blocker. And I watched Hockey 5 so you don't have to. And we'll talk about it. I mean, I hope. Are we gonna get to all these things? Who knows? Let's give it a try though, shall we? I don't know my comments in the usual place and I feel like I'm out of touch with humans. There we go. Oh, you're not quite done, Niels. <laughs> Test coming up soon. Okay, but I get it. Kate, good to see you. What is happening with my entire setup here? As soon as I click on it, it's going away. Hi, hockey moments. What's your real name? If you don't mind me asking. I just, I f it's gonna feel weird for me to call you moments or hockey moments or whatever. Look, if you're not sure if that this is going to be an awkward show or not, don't you worry. I've got all the awkward for you. Okay, here we go. First topic. This is one that I had a lot, a lot sent to me. This was a goalkeeper tackle. Yes, from the England Netherlands first game. She's being dispossessed by Berg and a chance here for the counter attack and Berg still going. Berg charging into the circle. Berg on the reverse stick. Here comes Hinch and Hinch takes the ball. Well, that was risky play by Hinch because Berg had her body between Hinch and the ball. So Hinch had to go through Berg to get the ball. Yes, she got the ball in the end. Let's have a look at this challenge again. Oh. I mean, it, looking at it from that side, I'd probably say actually Hinch has hit her at the same time as taking the ball. Okay. We don't have fantastic angles and the frame rates from this footage were just horrible. So, um, oh here, I gotta move this again. Excuse me, go to the next scene. What's happening? I don't know. I don't know what's happening. So, I think one of the first things that we have to realize is that when we first see a play like this, if we as umpires wanting to learn from these situations, the first thing we have to do is acknowledge the angle at which we're seeing the play. And our instinct is to in just jump to one conclusion or another. Absolutely correct call, absolutely incorrect call. But what we should be evaluating are the whys, the hows, and the factors. This is the only way we're gonna get smarter when we watch these things, okay? So don't jump to a conclusion. Acknowledge that maybe you don't have the perfect angle. Now the replay wasn't very helpful either from this. We could see it, but when the directors picked up on this play, they they didn't show us a good part of the lead up. I wanted to see more of Hinch's movement coming towards the attacking player in this case, okay? But what are the factors we look for and what are your thoughts on this play? I wanna hear from all of you and my clip is got a big black space in it so I'm gonna have to keep paying attention to that but I'd love to hear what you have to say um, let's see somebody has to try H&M yes I have to try H&M when I talk about hockey moments 
Um, Raj has called it. So if you're unhappy with your nickname, give me something else to call you. I'm just saying. Okay. There are a few things that I would point out from an evaluation perspective. And one of the things that I first look at is where is the umpire and what are they conveying with their signaling, their body language, their communication, all of those things. Okay. And although Sarah is at an angle where she's a little bit like the, the, the prone or the supine goalkeeper is going to be a little bit in her way. She really isn't a great spot to see everything that she needs to see here. And her body language is very strong and positive. Okay. As the collision is occurring, she is pointing and that is a signal that many umpires use to say, yep, the ball's right there. We're playing this on. Okay. It's not an advantage. It's not that she's going to come back to something. It's yep. Play on the ball's right there. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Simon Webb, you had the benefit of being pitch side as a photographer. The supporting umpire, Ali Keo, had a good view to support control. Yep. Uh, to support the control. It looked perfect from the position that you were in. Okay. So angles are really, 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 really important. Did I mention that they're really important? Why do I have this big black space? Somebody didn't prove her edits on her clips. Okay. What are the factors we look for? Every tackle, I want to watch the movement of the goal of the defender. And in this case, it's the goalkeeper. Where are they coming from? Do they have to move to the side? Are they in the space first or do they come late? Are they reaching for the ball? Or do you see them approaching the space with control? Yes, with pace, but are they approaching with control? Are they in the space before the attacker gets to it? And unlike field players, goalkeepers are allowed to go down low, to get crouched, to get, to, sorry, to, to go down low and to be on the floor and play the ball with their body. They are expected to do so, and they can use the full extent, the full extent of their body. Unlike field players, they can stretch out and make that barrier because their job is to stop the ball from going in the goal. Okay. So from this angle, I see a rapid approach, but control on the stop. I don't see that goalkeeper needing to make any adjustments in order to get contact with the ball as the attacker is coming in. The attacker is coming in, she's getting properly channeled and harried by the chasing defender who's on the play. Okay, so I'm looking at that. Is the attacker moving around the goalkeeper or are they moving perhaps into the goalkeeper? Okay, so those are the things that I'm looking for in this situation. So I'd like to know what you saw. Um, was the goalkeeper moving at the moment of contact? It is a little difficult to see, uh, Niels, and that is a very good question to ask. We don't expect them to be motionless, okay? It's, it's a very difficult thing, but what we're looking for is not some kind of extended slide through and, and out of control movement. Okay. They do not have to be paused stationary and just waiting for the attacker to come into their space. They need to be in control and their job is to close down the angle as quickly as they can. Is it not? Because if they sit back and allow the attacker to approach and give them all kinds of room and time to decide what they're going to do, well, they're going to get beat. Hi, Justin. I'm glad you're here. I'm going to come. I'm going to go look for your channel afterwards. After the show. Don't let me forget. Pappy, 
Good to have you. Could we go for a free hit out for the impact on the attacker on the keeper? Yeah, we could. We could. Because what you're trying to point out, Pappy, is that perhaps with that extent of a wipeout that the goalkeeper was then disadvantaged. She was obstructed. And had the ball come back into play and been in the circle, she could have been at a disadvantage to make her next saving action. Okay, so that is a good thing to point point out. That's possible. I think Sarah felt that she could play on in that situation because of where the ball was and how it came under control of the defender pretty much immediately. Raj, Sarah's body language was very positive and clear. There was no reaction from the Dutch player. There was a little bit. The Dutch player on the ground, she kind of... You know, huh, you know, there's a, a little bit of that. I, I trimmed out parts of the replay that I didn't feel were contributing. I try to keep things concise, you know, for y'all, because I know your time is precious. Okay, Rachel, goalkeeper was ahead of the ball before it arrived and she was under control. I agree with that. And the Dutch player did have her hand up afterwards. Yep, yep, she, she wasn't happy. Um, the, the, the slow-mo is what I have, but because of where the directors cut it, Niels, I can't show you the reverse angle, you know, any slower. So what I can do, it's really hard because the frame rates are really bad. So if I do this scroll here, it's very jumpy. Let's see if I go to the, I'll go to this and see if it's better. Okay, so if you're looking from the broadcast angle, okay, this is probably a good frame to see where the starting point of the goalkeeper is. But this is very deceptive. It's not, it's better just to watch it in real time and just to do your best. To be honest, as soon as I start jumping it, it just doesn't look right. Okay. I hope that helped a little bit. David, you thought the attacker moved a body illegally to shield the ball from the second angle. Yeah. Okay. So after we've initially concentrated on and assessed... When we are umpiring, when we're in this position, we're going to pick up on, as I think Sarah did, if the goalkeeper is doing the things right or the defender is doing the things right in the tackle, you wonder, well, why are they not able to reach the ball? This is a shield. This is absolutely a body shield. And if this had resulted in due to what I think is a reasonable amount of control from the goalkeeper, if that had resulted in a penalty stroke, I would have considered that to be a, a, a tough decision. Even Charlie Broom from the broadcast booth says, you know, he notices that, he, that the attacker had the ball behind her body, which caused then Hinch to go through. So those were definitely things that we noticed. As the attacker gets into the D, Luke Pibworth, uh, her body position starts to move in line with the ball. They're getting ready to shield. Yeah. Shane, goalkeeper straight out from the goal. No change in direction. Defender turned back into goalkeeper. Could have been obstruction. You might have played on from this. Simon, I don't think the attacker knew the goalkeeper was coming. Yeah, she was, she was under a lot of pressure. Um, you know, she was on a partial break here from in front of the center line but she had one defender to beat second defender to beat and then she was getting channeled effectively i think like that that defender did the right thing i i don't think she should have jumped in for the first um attempted tackle anyway but that's coaching thing and but what she did was just you know take away that space and the possibility for that attacker to feel like they could go to the right and kept her going to the left, which helped her go straight into the goalkeeper, who is allowed to use her body to stop the ball. Niels, um, she had her hands towards the ball, not to point in the air advantage. Well, you know, either way, okay. I'm not trying to import whether um, Sarah felt there was a foul there, and I don't think she was, because she's pointing with her right hand. Okay, so I don't think she felt like she needed to intervene at all, that she could just play that on either way. 
You made a mistake in your comment. Shane, who do you think you are? Said defender meant attacker. I think I understand what you meant. Okay. So I think for us, <laughs> I'm moving things along quickly here, gang. Always remember, you're looking for the defender's movement first. Are they moving into the ball? Are they swinging their stick? Or do they have their stick on the ground? If it's a goalkeeper, are they swinging their body? Are they moving recklessly through a slide into that challenge? Okay. I'm not saying this is like a 99%, you know, absolute call. It is, it is closer. But on the balance, if you focus on the movement of the goalkeeper, I think you see what is a relative, you know, amount of control that you would expect given that the goalkeeper can't be penalized for needing to move quickly. Okay. And the fact that she was on her feet and then put herself down in order to stop herself as soon as possible and the attacker didn't know that she was there, that's not on the goalkeeper, that's on the attacker. Okay. And then once you see that and you see, well, why is she having to go through the player in order to get to the ball? Well, because the ball's being shielded. And you can pick up on the motion of the attacker much more easily if you focus on the defender. Okay, for me, that's the most important thing that you wanna look at. You can play with your positioning in these situations. So knowing that a goalkeeper is gonna come out supine and they're gonna stretch themselves out on the ground, you can take the position that Sarah did. You might want to consider maybe flashing up even further so you can see around. That might be helpful. And especially if you have a good gauge of where all the other players are and you know that that's not a difficult position, that might be a place to go that helps you get best vision on the ball. Okay. Speak to your colleague and check that they didn't see anything different. Yeah. If, if you have, if you have any, if you pick up any doubt, that's time. I'm terrible at this. <laughs> but yes, Raj, if you pick up doubt, having a quick check-in, and if you don't have radios, you're going to be looking for their body language and the signals that you've agreed upon in your pre-match chat that you're going to pick up on to say, oh, uh, they have something to tell me. Okay. And if you have radios, you might say something as the control initiating the contact saying, are we good? You saw what I saw? Okay. And then they have the opportunity to respond, but don't make the mistake. I think that we sometimes do with radios that we get really excited that we can help out so much. And we start saying, oh no, 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 no. That's not the right call. No, no, no. That's a stroke. No, no. Keep in mind your role is support for a reason. It's called that because you're there to be called upon to help if it's needed. If you believe that your colleague's been unsighted from something like, let's say for example, the ball had struck the trailing defender's foot and that's something that Sarah probably couldn't see, she wouldn't know that she hadn't seen something that she hadn't seen. So that is something that you chime in for, but her evaluation of the quality of the tackle and whether that was legal, is more left to the controlling umpire. So be judicious about how you contribute that advice. Uh, you think in a match, a controlling umpire says Luke is heavily relying on supporting umpire with keeper blocking a lot of the view. So without them telling me anything, it's play on. Okay. So yeah, I'm just sort of coloring that a little bit because as a support, you're going to pick up on the body language and the positioning of your colleague to be able to make a decision as to whether they need your help or not. Okay. So keep that in mind, very positive, very controlled. She felt strongly. She knew she had the call. So keep that in mind. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we picked up on all of that. The last thing I wanted to say about this is that there was somebody on Twitter who decided to chime in and they used the magic word that you know that I love so much. And they accused the umpires in this match of being 
biased. Which brings me to one of my two rants of the week. It's not like you don't know this is coming, and I touched on it last week. It's no surprise to me, no surprise to me at all, that it's only when a losing result happens that a, someone who is clearly a supporter of a team chimes up and says, wait a minute, I need somebody to blame for this. The week prior on Twitter, I had an English fan who just happened to point out, oh, I was just sort of curious about this thing that now our team lost to China. Of course, they didn't say that part. They just said, I just sort of noticed that there was a Chinese umpire umpiring China in this two match series. Is that cool? Of course, when you phrase it like that, you put me in the position where I either say, if I say that it's cool, then I'm contradicting myself with my steadfast and firm belief that we should have nothing but not neutral appointments for the pro league and any international competition that means anything but the slyness of the accusation brought out a really snarky response in me that they picked up on they're like don't you attack me and i'm like uh well sure i didn't attack you everything's fine Here's the thing. If I had one person come to me and say, you know, I was watching Belgium, South Africa today and I'm a steadfast Belgian fan. And you know what? That five, that, that four, two win for Belgium, it was really unfair. I thought the umpires made a lot of decisions in favor of my team that they absolutely didn't deserve. It was a disappointing performance and we didn't deserve the win. Come at me with that and then we can have a discussion. You're still wrong, but at least we can have a discussion. Being neutral and being able to evaluate officiating the performances requires a lot of practice and a lot of training. And you know what? I watch matches now where I feel like I've lost the ability to celebrate. I've lost the ability to cheer and to be happy when a team wins. Because you know what? I've worked so hard at not being influenced by those things and just trying to be principled and applying what we need to apply to be consistent, to be uniform, that that's kind of gone for me. And that's a bit sad too, and I recognize that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be disappointed when your team loses. What I'm saying is, don't come at me with the bullshit. Oh, whoops. I meant And that, friends, is one of my rants of the week. Okay. Um, Neil's winners have a plan and losers have an excuse. Love that. Ha, how you like that? Okay, topic two. Let's go. Dangerous shots. Uh, we had a couple of these. And I'm a little concerned that I didn't program my stream deck for all of them. This was the first one that came to my attention from... From the match yesterday between Belgium and South Africa. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this one. That hits him outside the post. I think his hands are outside the line of the post. And he's trying to evade, I don't think this one, because... I think he's outside the line of the post. Is 
there. He's standing outside the post. That hits him outside the post. If it doesn't hit Spooner, that, that is going wide. Great angle, though. <laughs> Good. Yeah. There is no clear reason to change the decision. So that we can lose the Excellent. So, goal is awarded. So there's no clear reason. So there's no danger because it's going wide. So, so there's no clear reason, so for me it wasn't, it, it wasn't dangerous, and for the video on fire as well. Yeah? Are you, no? Ready? Are you ready? Okay. So let's have a look at this, and let's reason it through from the standpoint that this is a decision that sometimes we need to make on the pitch. And... One of the things that I think is really important for umpires to go through, especially because we don't have the luxury of a, of a video umpire, is that in our pre-match chat, we should be agreeing that the supporting umpire in this situation is going to have primacy on two elements of the penalty corner decision. Okay, this is the only time that you kind of give over a little bit of your control for these situations. And it's this. First of all, if this drag flick, if it hits the defender, has it hit them above or below the knee? Because they're gonna be able to see the height much better and they're gonna have a better view as to whether that shot that then hits a defender closer to the goal is going on target or going wide, okay? We do have, for reference, the shot at goal provision. Okay. And this is it here in the rule book. The action of an attacker attempting to score playing the ball towards a goal from within the circle. The ball may miss the goal, but the shot is still a shot at goal if the player's intention is to score with a shot directed towards the goal. Okay. That doesn't directly apply in terms of how we look at any particular rule under section nine or under section 13, which governs how penalties are adjudicated or played. But it guides us because we have, there's the ability, for example, to intentionally raise a shot or to raise the ball if it's a shot at goal. Okay, so those are the things that we can agree upon right there. And I'm gonna to go to your comments next, and then I'm gonna talk about a few other principles that I think we need to keep in mind. Okay, for David, it's a goal. Hi. Thinking you were bang on time, Michael. Um, I run a tight ship. What are you talking about? Scott, expectations are a big part of whether particular shots should be considered dangerous or not from you. For example, if you're on the line, you can expect it at any height, so not dangerous. Okay, that's one thing to consider. Juan Pablo Dabrowski, como estas? Um, you think in here it's very important the supporting umpire, yes. If they are in the correct position, they would be able to see the direction of the ball. Absolutely, okay. And what's kind of, I don't wanna say disappointing, but it's a little bit of a shift that I think we lose a bit out on is that with the video umpire, being present at this level of play, the supporting umpire isn't pulled into the, these discussions in the first instance. And they aren't looked to as often by the control because the control says, well, I've got the video to go to, so it's fine. I'd like to see still the controlling umpire being, you know, helping more in these instances. They still often do when it comes to hitting the, the runner above or below because that call needs to be made a lot more often at this level. And going one way or the other dictates whether a referral can be made or not. Sometimes because a team has lost the referral, they still retained it, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanna keep that in mind. Simon, had it not hit his glove, uh, it would have hit the stick and still likely gone in. The fact it's off target by the rules is not relevant as any shot is a shot now. The defender could reasonably expect a shot on goal there would be like that, given it is a penalty corner. 
Oh, Rachel, going wide of the goals, it hits the defender, also looks like legitimate evasive action. Okay, so I'm a little surprised at how pro goal this is because of the following. And I've, I've talked about this in other shows. The definition of what's a shot on goal and what we treat as a shot on goal is used in two different scenarios. Okay, one is about what is dangerous and therefore not allowed by attackers. And then also about what is permitted by defenders. So for example, especially back in the day when you couldn't use your stick above your shoulder unless you were stopping a shot at goal, that definition came into play there. My feeling is, under the spirit of the rules, is that when it comes to permitting a defender to take a legitimate goal-saving action, the shot at goal definition was expanded in order to allow, and this, this shot at goal definition has been in place for a number of years, and I should have looked at exactly how many. If any of you enterprising viewers want to look back in your rule books and let me know, how long it's been like this. I think it has been in place for quite some time. It was to be more permissive to let defenders exercise their skill and not penalize them if that shot wasn't coming directly on the target. Okay, so if it was going a little bit outside the post, you weren't then gonna go, oh no, 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 that's a penalty stroke for breaking down the play by using your stick above the shoulder because that ball wasn't actually going in. I mean, really? like. It doesn't feel fair. It's not within the spirit of the rules to penalize a defender in that situation. I've argued that when it comes to danger, we flip that because in this sense, danger should not be a reason and attackers creating danger, a reason to expand and to take an expansive view of what a shot at goal is. This is when we get a little bit more restrictive because of the spirit of the game. And what you have in this situation as a defender, I think unquestionably taking legitimate evasive action. It is simply the skill of this player to be able to get a stick on the ball instead of getting thwacked in the chest. And it was asked by the commentary, and I think it's a very valid question to ask, if you were in this situation and you could pick up on this angle, would you call that as dangerous if it hit the player in the chest rather than hitting them in the stick and then deflecting into the net? Okay, it was not gonna go into the net unless it was deflected. It was going wide. But should we not then treat that as dangerous because of the disadvantage to the defender in that situation? We, ex we hold them responsible for stopping shots at goal, but are we gonna hold them responsible for shots that are going wide of the goal? And say that they are expecting this ball to, they're not. They're expecting this ball to be on the target and precisely on the target. Okay. Now, are we gonna have this precise situation? Are we gonna have something exactly like this? No, we're not. So it's not important, as important for me, for us to be looking at whether this particular decision was correct or not. But what I want to illustrate, what I want to really tease out of this is why we use certain definitions and how we apply them in this situation when it comes to danger. I think if we're going to take the position that defenders are responsible for put, putting themselves in dangerous positions. That also means that when they're in a position where they shouldn't be expecting the danger, we shouldn't be holding them to that criterion. Okay, I'm gonna look to your comments and see what you guys think and whether you think I'm making a good argument or not. 
Michael, a provocative question, which I may have already asked. Who knows? Um, what do we think about the potential danger to the number one runner from the shot? The ball pa passes very close to his body as the player is turning, releases clearly within five meters of the player. Yeah, I'm not. We have enough problems right now. Unless it's hit, it hits them, we we can't gauge where where that flight of that ball was going to be. Okay. You think no danger for the runner out, but it's a close call. Inches to the left off the attacker stick and the ball hits. If, maybe you're saying if the ball hits the number one runner. Okay, let's, let's try to figure this out first because this is hard enough. Personally, you wouldn't. It's the player's own, it's the player's own chance, to, own choice to stand inside the post. That's not where he got hit with the ball. He got hit with the ball outside of the post. He's actually doing the better thing. He's not using his body to stand in front of the, where a goal would be scored. He's actually moving a little bit out of the way. And then as the ball comes, he moves even further out of the way. Tell me if I'm on drugs. Martin, the shot was di not directed at the defender on post. He moved across the line, so not dangerous. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. If it's a hit for Pappy, you'll go for danger. If it's not a hit, you'll go for the five meter danger. I don't know if that's a five. Okay, you're, oh, you're talking about the question that Michael asked that was hard enough based on 9-9. If he'd stayed inside the post and not stepped left, the ball would have sailed past him. Yeah, that's true, but do, do we hold? Okay, okay. Martin, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing your argument now. And yeah, what, what Rachel responds with, I think would be my response as well, is that he was still trying to get out of the way and not into the line okay i mean he that ball was coming extremely fast and if you watch his positioning he's he's already standing a little bit outside and then he legitimately evade, evades that ball by moving even further Michael, as a disengaged umpire, you'd be looking down the left-hand post, so more likely you'd see this as going wide off target and therefore danger-free hit defense. Watch the movement of the player to support danger, yes or no. Yeah. I think that we have to be very careful and very precise about the situations in which we attribute the responsibility of the defender here. And there's a point at which we can go too far and we can make it too hard on them. There are still dangerous shots on goal as we're going to see in a second. Okay, so I want you to think about what you do expect a defender to do in these situations and what you will hold them responsible for and what you'll hold an attacker responsible for. And for me, I would change the equilibrium a little bit. I'd change the balance point a little bit in this situation because a defender is not expecting the shot to be off target. A defender who is standing outside the goal is not putting their body in a position that they will block the goal. That's, that's where it, for me, I, I get my most, I feel my most resistance to attributing danger to an attacker there, because if you're blocking the goal with your body, you're saying, if I don't get it with my stick, at least something's going to stop it. Okay. He's actually stepping outside a little bit so that he can use his stick to protect that post. And then he still has to duck. 
So my hockey spirit, my hockey heart says no. Uh, Luke, this is a good point. We shouldn't encourage umpires to interpret danger only when it doesn't hit a stick through luck or skill. And this is luck and skill. <laughs> okay? Like, it's it's just incredible. And it's, it's well-trained basics that save him from getting smoked. But make no mistake, like, watch him. He is ducking. <laughs> he is evading. And a ball is also considered dangerous when it causes legitimate evasive action by the opponents. 9.8. Michael, absolutely. If that ball is on target, the defender is far enough away to have an obligation to get out of the way. So no danger. This is different, but only just. And it's fine margins. Okay, it's fine margins. And you will maybe never have the same fine margin as close. But I want you to consider this because these are the pieces that you're gonna to have to pick together. And as a few of you have noted, and as I said right at the beginning, make sure that this is part of your pre-match chat. Make sure that you have talked about this. And so you know, and you as the controlling umpire, don't make your decision first. This is a stop play situation. So you have the opportunity. The ball's one wide, the ball's hit the, you know, player, you have the chance to look at your colleague and get their signal first. You have the chance to say, what? <laughs> Wide or on target? Uh, Pappy, you weren't clear the player can raise the ball even if it's not a shot on goal, if it's not a hit. Yes, but they can't do so dangerously. So if the defender was hit on the chest by a raised ball without a hit on more than five, no danger PC. No, I disagree. I disagree. There's a lot more things that go into a danger equation than just the five meter distance. Okay. Uh, no, that's not the way it goes. The five meter distance is in the guidance specifically for us to guide us when we're looking at penalty corners. Okay. It is merely an aid in interpretation in other situations. Sorry, I'm gonna flip down to 13 here. Okay, taking a penalty corner. People have fastened on the five meters and they've extended it to a lot further, okay? If the first shot at goal is a hit, the ball must cross the goal line, blah, blah, blah. Okay, wait, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so here's the guidance. A defender who is clearly running into the shot must be penalized for dangerous play. Otherwise, if a defender is within five meters of the first shot at goal and is struck with a ball below the knee, another penalty corner must be awarded. Okay, then the shot is judged to be dangerous and a free hit. And it doesn't say that if they're outside five meters, the shot can't be dangerous. And I say that if the shot isn't on goal, that's when it is dangerous and we apply a stricter interpretation, okay? So there's a lot more that goes into it. Once that first layer, we're not talking about the first runner here. We're talking about the post player. If they are inside the goal, absolutely. That's, they're the ones creating the danger. They're outside the goal. They're not creating the danger for themselves. They're just there. <laughs> Um, Michael, one observation. This reinforces how important the positioning of the disengaged umpire is to make sure you got the best sight lines on shot off the primary drag flicker. Absolutely. And be prepared to move. Very good point. Raj, video referrals you mentioned acted as the supporting umpire. However, in opinion, it was not dangerous and hence a goal. Um, I'm sure they did discuss it. They would have a debrief. And my point here is not to say this is incorrect or correct. The questions that people have when we follow up on these things is, how do I apply this? And what umpires are asking me about is, well, so do I have to, you know, does it mean that if the shot isn't strictly on target that a defender is still going to be held responsible? And I don't like that interpretation. I don't. And you got it too. Okay, cool. 
this is this is a very very close decision okay let's go to another situation i think from this game this is the wrong clip everybody let's see if i can fix this on the fly um here it is Don't worry, don't worry. Okay, here it is. Pinard drops it out. And Dretch. No. Doesn't, Doesn't matter. 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 Yeah, I, I gave a free up for danger. Can you just check um, and look at the distance? Yeah. So this was earlier in the same game. There are, oh, there's a whole host of people in there, isn't that? Everyone's appealing. I want you to watch the traffic nice work on flow. Play. Got back, Hendricks. Rachel agrees straight through a crowd of players. There is no clear reason to change your decision. It was dangerous and Belgium lose the referral. Okay. Right after that, right after that, this happened and I want you to see it. Deary me, that's not the aerial okay. to throw. They could be in real trouble here. Lovely little turn on the reverse. Dick shot comes in and put over the, the top. No, no, it's this, it's this. Now let's see if I have the replay queued up properly. Because I'm thinking I don't. And I'm gonna have to fix this one too. Correct, I was right, okay. So hold on for a hot minute. I'm looking forward to your comments. Oops, oops, oops. And I want that to drop there. Guys, I'm a pro. Don't try this at home. Don't try to change your scenes on the fly like I do. Okay. Let's see what you have here, gang. Proximity of green 18 amongst others. This one, not at the goal, hence dangerous again, is probably what you're talking about, the second one. The Belgium shot on the reverse. Yeah, wasn't on target. So I just included that in the clip because I had someone contact me by DM on Twitter saying, but look at the next one and that was allowed. So therefore like, what the hell about this one? And I say to every individual is please take into account, as I mentioned while we were watching the last clip, all of the other factors as well. And in this one, it is the danger that's presented by having so many bodies in between the firing of the shot. It's not as hard as some shots have been. It is not as high as some dangerous shots have been, but it's very difficult for players to legitimately evade, to get out of the way of shots they can't see because there's somebody in front of them. And there were like six, five or six bodies all going like this as that ball was being sent. This one here, again, there's a difference because, because there's vision towards this. Do I think this is dangerous because it's not going on target? Yes, I do. It's an intentionally raised hit that isn't a shot at goal and we apply a strict interpretation. Okay, but just getting one right and then missing the next one doesn't mean that the one before it was incorrect as well. Okay, we have to be more discerning about this and we have to tease out what the principles are. Also, keep in mind that the result of the second shot was not a goal. It was not a penalty stroke being awarded or a penalty corner. It just went out for a 23 meter. Less intervention required. 
so we're not as bothered by it. Okay. Luke, so the first video, the defender is marking, so has the right to be there. Absolutely. If they weren't marking them, the defender's causing danger. And I'm not saying it's great marking because you have like, if you watch, there's, I, I don't know what they're doing because there was somebody wide open. If, if you, let me see if I can just pause it. Cause I was just like, what are you doing? Like dude at the top of the circle is like, well, well open. Dish the ball to that friend. Okay, and then you've got you've got a defender trying to slip into the hotline here, as Gareth taught me to say, and you've got a double marking situation. Which hey, maybe you want to do that if that's Charlie or Bone or something like that. Yeah, double mark them. I can I can understand that. But you, what you don't have is a player protecting the goal. Players are not protecting the goal. Look how wide open he is at the top. Give him the ball. Give him the ball. And that's the other thing that you sort of notice is like, there's all this traffic here, but there's space over here. That is a dangerous option. Why am I going to reward that? The vital difference for you, Simon, is that in open play, it's harder for a defender to anticipate a shot. In the PC, there's a fair bet they drag it high. Yeah, but there's not a fair bet that he'd drag it wide. Sorry. I just, I, I, want, I want you to challenge yourself on this one. Not because of what was right or wrong in that situation, but because of what you are going to be confronted with on the pitch. Okay? And I really want all of this to be open and, and you, you to, to soak this in because I think you need this in order to make really good decisions out on the pitch. Okay, so we look at more factors. You're right, Simon. We look at whether it's open play or it's predicted. It's it's a set piece. We look at we look at height. We look at trajectory. We look at vision. We look at whether the defender is protecting the goal or they're marking a player. We look at distance that they have. We look we look at a myriad of factors in order to assess danger. This doesn't make danger calls inconsistent. It makes them responsive to the full scope of what danger actually is. And that, <laughs> I should have started this clock a long time ago because that's a great way to end this conversation. Damn it. Why can't I do this better? Okay. Let's just see if there's anybody else who chimes in with a comment there. Oh, we have a couple more. The second open play Belgium me is a clear view of the path and it's reasonable expected player can react with the view of that flight. Yeah, it's reasonable, but I still think that because it wasn't going on target that you apply a stricter standard. If it's going on target, yes, a defender is expecting that ball. But if it's not, mm -mm. Both receiving players were aware of the ball and ready to play it. If it was on target, I don't think it would be as bad. Correct. Thank you. Uh, Tomo's position for the original danger call is deeper versus side. Uh, yes, absolutely. Positioning is vital. And as you saw in that play, the, uh, that really poor aerial that ended up getting cut out and boom, it was a quick transition. And so, you know, Tom didn't have as much time to get in a mission critical position where he could make the best decision there. So... I, you know, little things like that influence our ability to see danger properly. Little tiny adjustments of angle. Okay, so that's a really good point. Thank you for, for bringing that up there. Okay. It, yeah, it makes the decision more difficult. Very good. Okay, thanks very much for that. I think we got a, you know, I think we got through a lot of those principles. And in the next set of... It's, it's almost like these are flowing together a little bit because we're going to look at penalty corner first hits coming up in the next segment. Penalty corner first hits. It's, it's a phrase you just can't abbreviate. It doesn't make sense. But I'm going to try. Because you mean that much to me. That's time. Okay. Before we go on, I just want to celebrate. Wait, 
Where is it? There it is. We're coming. I really want to send out appreciation to Mark uh, for signing up for green uh, because he doesn't have to. He's part of one of the red groups and just didn't have to lend a support like this, but he did. And doesn't he look great in polka dots? Look at that. Okay, I couldn't find another picture. But the dog's really cute, so. Are you mad? Of course you're not mad. Mark, thank you so much. I appreciate your support. And if you want to know more about this whole jam, especially because you're thinking, boy, I should sign up for the workshop. Come on. Why are my overlays not firing? It's killing me. Does this work? It's right here. Buttons. Who knew that they could be pressed? Go check it out, fhe3t.com, just like it says right there, and you can sign up for your mentorship. I announced this morning that the affiliate program for Yellow Members is in beta, so you can go check that out. Something weird is also happening on the website this morning, so if you're having problems logging in, I got you. Please slip into the Discord server and let me know. I am, once I get the show out of the way, I'm going to apply myself very rigorously, ripping apart. I'm going to have to turn off page caching and all kinds of stuff to get to the bottom of why things haven't been working properly for you. So I apologize for those difficulties. Thank you for being patient. But you're all going to be able to sign up for the workshop, which, incidentally, if you'd forgotten, it's there, fhempires.com forward slash communication, and it's held in the Discord. So you want to be a member of the Discord anyway. Okay. Are we ready for the next one? Yes, we are. Excellent. Are we on to three? Okay. The height of the first hit shot on the penalty corner. When the first shot is a hit. It matters. Two instances from the same game. Play on. Where is the shot? What a stop that is on the line. The whistle's already gone. And that is the end of the first half. It was Moshe who stops it on the line. I mean, that's a take. I think it was blown up for being too high. Um, the ball has to be backboard height as it crosses the goal, which always blows my mind. I think if the ball hits the backboard, it should be a goal and it takes away any grey area. That, for me, I think actually was touch and go, but as you say, it was a fantastic take by the post player. I think Mel's got a good point on the rule, in a way. It would be easier if we just got the backboard, but it would potentially allow a little bit less safety on this okay so the big reason i wanted to work through this clip is because even on through three replays and thanks to the terrible frame rate um i'm not sure exactly what happens in this situation so what's important for us is that we're working through the principles right principles 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 Okay, so we're looking for the trajectory of the ball, whether it crosses the goal line at 460 millimeters or below. Absent any deflections. Now there's some weird parts of the flight of the ball here. The second defender, I think potentially gets hit by this ball and changes the path. Okay. And if it does that, and if it's a hit, then we're looking at things like danger because the reason that the rule is there, the spirit of the rule is because of danger. We don't want the first hit shot on a penalty corner to be higher than 460 millimeters because it's way more likely to be dangerous. So we just don't want that to happen. Okay, so we're, we're creating a black and white, bright mark. Okay, but all those factors still come into play. 
So on the whole, on the balance, I do think that it's completely reasonable. What is happening with my darn clips? Uh, dodge. Dodgy caps lock. Okay, I am not going to get upset that you just yelled at me. Let's see. Was definitely dropping, but difficult to see exact height as I cross the line. Uh, yes, I mean, it looks like it was dipping, but I'm not sure why it was. There could have been a deflection. And what I think is, you know, you, you pick up on the body language of the players and all those sort of things. There was a lot going on. Um, Michael, you agree it had been deflected slightly on the way through. Too high danger all day for you on this one. Yes. So if it if it touches somebody on the way through, whether it's an attacker or defender, and that brings the ball lower, you don't take that into account. So the final result is not the most important thing. Was it on the path prior to any deflection by... And it's uh, by any player. Okay, right here. The ball may be higher than 460 millimeters during its flight before it crosses the goal line, provided there is no danger and provided it would drop of its own accord below 460 millimeters before crossing the line. Okay, so for me, that decision makes lots of sense. Uh, let's see what you got, Scott. Even if the deflection's a hit, it's no longer the first shot. So that could go high as long as it's safe using the other criterion. Okay. I th think we're in agreement. I'm going to take it that way. Back to the deflections. He's just going to go off now. Put it in the Play on. There's the shot. What a stop that is on the line. Whistle let's try this again gone. with the correct video. What? Oh, here it is. And it goes to her. Kersalt with the shot. And it's the, the same goal. end. And Maxine Kersalt brings the Netherlands okay. back into this one. This is another banana shot. Recalled last weekend after three As it's so delightfully called. The Dutch senior squad. She marks her third game back with this. You're not stopping that. You're not stopping that at all. It's... Um... I saw it last weekend with Janelle and it's just hit into the turf. It, it's basically the squeeze or the banana shot and hits can do that. So, you can... would like to hear from you as well. Do you see anything different here? Any sort of thing? Um, I can't remember. We had this discussion, I think. Was it in a previous week where we talked about the height of a goalkeeper's pads? And we looked at what the maximum width right of a goalkeeper's side. pads is and how that and interacts with this rule. And this is the result here, the goalkeeper's equipment. The leg guards have a maximum width of 300 millimeters on each leg so if a goalkeeper is perfectly squeezed stacked and all that kind of stuff they're going to be 300 millimeters so there's another 10 centimeters there that the ball could potentially go over how big's the ball again you see what you see what i'm putting together here friends sideboards nets external marks did I go the wrong way lines lines I did go the wrong way damn it I'm looking for the circumference or the radius of the ball I should really be smarter for this in case you weren't sure exactly what's happening here I'm realizing that I'm diving too deep into something I should have thought more thoroughly about. Okay, circumference of between, so it's basically 20 centimeters around. Okay, so, so if a goalkeeper's pads are stacked and they're toit, toit, then 
a banana shot isn't going to get over those leg guards. But in this case, oh good, it's the right one. But in this case, the shot went to the left of the goal and it went to the goalkeeper's stick side. So you don't have that guidance to sort of help you with the height. <laughs> Rachel's all on top of this, 300, so 600. Oh wait, so it's bigger. Each leg guard is 300. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, looks like an upwards deflection by the defender. Yep. I'm looking very carefully. So it could have been deflected there. Yeah, so there could have been other deflections, but it looked like it was traveling. And it's really difficult if that deflection happens close to the top of the circle, like how much path do you have to calculate your anticipated trajectory of that ball? Second seems clear, but slightly too high. Looking at where it hit the board potentially both are on the marginal side both could have gone either way absolutely and so again i'm not talking about whether this call was accurate or not it's how are we applying all the factors that we are supposed to be looking at agreed absolutely can see why ali's awarded the goal here is it hit the backboard comfortably below the top so very tough to it argued very tough to argue that it crossed the line too high but it's darn close yes and i think that um I don't know. I don't know what it was about the footage this weekend, but it just was just ugly. <laughs> and it was hard to see the angles. And I think any video umpire who would have who may have had to review this would have had a difficult time seeing clear evidence to overrule the decision. Yeah, bad camera angles. Uh, you're talking about the ball being approximately seven centimeters wide. Lols. <laughs> All good friends. Okay. So when it rains, it pours. That's two decisions on penalty corner hit shots in the same game. Really difficult. And again, you have to apply the criterion as best you can. You take an Occam's razor approach. The most simple explanation is the most likely explanation. And don't look for reasons to not award the goals. If you see something, or don't look for reasons to award a free hit defense. If there's something that's clear for you, off you go. But if not, you can award and then go talk to your colleague in this situation. Because again, they have that upper angle, they have that wide angle, and they are going to be able to inform you probably better than you can see as to any deflections that change the trajectory of the ball. Okay, oops, as I, as I do that, you can see my camera goes out of focus. So from the side, you might see, but it's the ball's moving very quickly. So it's much more likely your colleague's gonna be able to have a bit of a view like, oh, I saw the ball change as it approached this player. So I think that ball went up and then that ball went down, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but lots there. You're questioning yourself on the rule now, does the whole ball need to drop below 460 millimeters? If we apply the usual rule that the ball, if it touches the line it's in, I don't think the whole ball has to cross below 460 
millimeters in height. Can somebody give me an argument the other way? I'm listening. I am absolutely listening for this one, as I was focused on the wrong rule. I mean, we're talking about a difference of, you know, 20 centimeters, so that's tough. That's tough. It made you cringe a bit. <laughs> Good luck awarding a goal because the whole ball did not, wasn't below, yeah. Good luck not awarding the goal because the whole ball wasn't below the, yeah. Right? We're doing the best we can here. It says the ball needs to be under, so you'd say the whole ball has to be. I don't know. That's the, that's the contrary argument. But that flies in the face of, yeah. Give me the reason why. Give me the reason. Give me the reason. You had the same Q&A last week, says Rachel. Um, did I look at the wrong... The wrong rule? Do I not understand words? Flag guards... Okay, so the circumference is between that. Is it is it a math thing that you know it's 7.13 centimeters? Somebody explain this to me. I'm a doctor, damn it. Not a... It reminds you... Oh, no, I hate that question! I hate that question. It's easy. Okay. Moving on, moving on. Let's go. Somebody tell me the math in the Discord server. Here's a quick one. I wanted to show you an example of an attempted aerial interception that does not come off. Okay, causes quite a bit of consternation for the player. Let's try it on the full play. Oh my god, I'm in grade 10 again. Don't play in Calgary where it's dry and cold. Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing showing that again? What is happening? I'm having a good time with my scenes today. Okay, so we've, we've discussed the new aerial interception rule and we've talked about when it's most likely this is going to work. And I've been talking to a few coaches lately about this and my advice to them is to focus on training their players to move across the path of the ball, not in line with it. Because any adjustment they make is likely going to take them through the danger area or into the danger area like we see in this example here. So the defender who is trying to intercept this ball has to move himself backwards into not just the five meter area, but within playing distance. And it is dangerous to the initial receiver of the ball. I think if that defender had had the opportunity to move across that play and pick the ball very high because 
the trajectory would have required him to be that high before it dropped, then he would have had the chance to make that. Okay, so as umpires, this is what we're looking for. Okay, this is a cue that can help you prepare for the decision that you're going to need to make as to whether this is dangerous. Okay, so Rachel, it's a clear initial receiver player moving into. Yes. And they, they move into the five meter distance. They move within playing distance and it's dangerous. You can see the evasive action that the attacker takes and maybe he plays it a little bit. But really considering at the, that he's trying to track the ball and then he's got a player that's moving underneath that ball and starts moving towards him and he's reaching a stick behind him. Yeah, actually, I probably would be ducking there too. Um, now this is the difficulty, Mr. Eggleton, is that are we going to declare this as intentional? And I have spoken at length about the difficulty I think that umpire is going to have to try to decide that this particular action, this attempt is to break down play or is reckless as to the result of committing a foul, or if it's an honest attempt to intercept and he just doesn't know that there's a player that the initial receiver is at that point behind him, this would be a hell of a tough, like this would be a harsh intentional foul, I think. Just because of where they are. If the defender had come from behind the initial receiver, known exactly where he was and started running into, I think that's where you've, you've got something there. And that's just trying to break down the play. Michael's with a PC all day. It feels a little OTT or cruel, but it's the correct decision. Yeah. And there's going to be stress points. Okay, we're, we're gonna be, we're, we're gonna move through conflict points with players as we get to know what we expect to see from a safe interception and what is not a safe interception. Okay, but I hope this helps. The more times we see this now, it's gonna prepare you in your matches, whether you're playing this rule now or you're gonna be playing this rule in September because you belong to a country that doesn't believe in keeping pace with international rules that you're going to want to look at that. Oh, we don't even need to do a two minute warning there. I think we're good. How are we doing for time? Oh, <gasps> I thought we were doing a lot better for time. Okay. <laughs> These are a little faster. Um, this is a free hit for the defense that's taken inside the circle. And I just wanted to point this out because this is something we don't see enough. And I actually got caught on this when I was umpiring a couple weeks ago because I wasn't expecting the teams at this level to understand that rule. And they took the ball very quickly from deep inside the circle. It wasn't far off where the foul occurred. But by taking it there, instead of marching it up to the top, to the 15 meter line, and then taking the free hit from there, they gained a significant advantage because as you see in this situation here, the players were turned away. The now defenders, the team who had just been dispossessed of the ball, weren't looking for it. They were too busy looking at the umpire first and then off it went. Okay, so this is a really, really smart heads up play. I love everything about this. And it's just another reason why we as umpires have no time to sleep. There is no rest. We call a free hit. And the first thing we have to think about is where can this ball be taken from? Am I going to let it be taken five meters laterally that way or that way? Could it be taken from inside the circle? Does it have to be? It's a 15 meter free hit. So it has to be taken up 15 meters because the ball crossed the end line last touch by an attacker, blah, blah, blah. You are going through these calculations constantly. We don't get to be lazy at all. It's really sad.
Um, yeah, you're talking about the last scenario again? I'll just earmark this so I come back. And Michael's not giving a penalty stroke for the last situation. Sorry. Yep. So, oops. I wanted to show this part. Sorry. This scene. Okay. And this is just an iteration of what we all know. It's just good to look at it. It's good to see it because we don't see players at our levels necessarily doing this very often. So, there it is. I am so tempted to get up and raise my shade because my camera is very dark now. But, okay, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. You can't stop me. It's five minutes. Hi. <laughs> okay. I can see my mute, my my stuff there. Yep. Anywhere in the circle. Simon Webb. Very clever understanding of the rule until in one of my matches the clearance was accidentally raised to a stationary attacker just outside the D. Yeah. Yeah, you do because I think there's just less space in indoor and so um it's it's a little harder in outdoor to see where it can be advantageous to take it from say that deep inside the circle but it can happen the ball over the end line doesn't have to go 50 meters out oh, correct no maximum 50 meters you're absolutely correct it can be played yes but it has to be in line with where it went out that's all yep and this is what i'm trying to avoid I'm making us all better. We are not going to be that umpire that calls it back. In my game, when it happened, I was like, wait a minute, that's, oh, good play, guys. <laughs> and they all laughed at me. So it's all fine. Many decent teams now, says Mike, understand the power of the quick free hit from free hit defense from inside the circle and not even where the foul is just anywhere. But if you're outside, it must be in line. Correct. Good work, you guys. Smart, smart. Here's our last clip. Here's our last clip. What is happening? Oh my goodness. Since we've talked about goalkeepers losing helmets so much recently. Circle. Get a load of this. Yeah. Yesterday was chaos. One half the game, nut bar. Everything happened. You would disagree with an umpire coach. A free hit defense was awarded close to the back line. Everyone included were lined up to it. You were happy, but after the defense took their time connecting the ball, your coach said they had to take it up. No. No. I am glad you refused. That point. And I think what we expect to see often influences how we think things are correct under the rules okay let's hear what you think about this yep i think i have the rules queued up properly for this one so hopefully it won't take us too long to go through it Whoa. This show has flown by. And I haven't even talked about fives yet. Is she gonna rant again? I don't know. But she has so many thoughts about hockey fives. Taco, you were once clattered on your foot by a fast 50 minute restart taken as a slap pass off the baseline. Yeah. Ooh, when you were umpiring? Ooh, that would be harsh. Radoslav. Can I call you Rads? No. 
Bratislav. I'll try to pronounce it correctly. No issue as long as he has a stick in his hand. So, because I've been caught out a few times recently, I was very particular about making sure I went to the rules in this case. And this is also what you should do. I pulled out the rule book and I looked at 4-4. And I looked at the requirements, again, of what goalkeepers must wear in terms of their protective equipment. Because if they have to wear this, that means if they're not wearing it, they can't do goalkeeper things. They must wear head guard, leg guards, kickers, except the headgear and hand protectors can be removed for a penalty stroke. Now this, like what? But why would you say that the player, that the goalkeeper can remove their hand protectors to take a penalty stroke when they're not required to wear them elsewhere? This is such a poorly, poorly worded rule. But to me, you can't read this any other way than to say that the mandatory equipment is a head guard, headgear, leg guards, and what's a head guard? It's a head guard. Headgear, leg guards, and kickers. Okay, so that's the first rule that we have to worry about. Then the second rule for goalkeepers is 10.1 about the protective headgear that must be worn at all times. And 10.2, that when they have a stick in their hand, they can do all the things. Okay. The only other rule that we might have to worry about is the throwing of equipment. Wah, wah. Oops. And for some reason, I didn't clip this one, but I should have. Do, 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 You're awesome. Okay. I had it. But apparently I don't. I'll just put this up so y'all can watch it. Oh, no. I was going to do this. It's okay. It's okay. It's It's been 90 minutes, so clearly my brain just shuts off. Um, just above section 10 is, uh, 916 players must not throw any object or piece of equipment onto the field ball or at another player, umpire or person. Okay. The argument can be made. And when I slowed this down to as slow as I could slow it, as the ball is lifting over the goalkeeper, he kind of but I think it's in his effort to whip his blocker around that he's got his fingers extended potentially and he whoop, and that has the effect of not throwing. He's not like throwing his, his blocker, but it comes off his hand at that moment because of his action. Even if you can argue that as a throw, it doesn't make contact with the ball. And then as you see, it's very, very, I've slowed it down as much as I can. This is 5% people. And the, the blocker actually makes contact with the attacker's right foot behind, but doesn't cause any disadvantage. It doesn't change the path of the ball or anything like that. So this, I believe, is this kind of situation is a play on situation. Let me see what you all have. Yeah, it's a very bad sentence. Very bad sentence. I'm so mad. It's a bad sentence. Why isn't it looping? I... Fight. Okay. Correct. I did say it. No issue, no issue. Nope, I can't. Oh, good. I asked, okay. Ratto. Not Rado, Ratto, right? Okay, Ratto. Had this happen in a game with the goalkeeper glove, if it doesn't impact play and not deliberate, then play on. If it does impact, consider a PC penalty stroke depending on the context. It's not an essential bit of kit. Okay. Now, remember, 
that this is not considered a piece of penalty corner protective equipment. It is not a hand protector of the defenders that is worn specifically for penalty corner, knee pads or face mask. Okay, so this is not a piece of equipment that has to be discarded properly so that it doesn't interfere with play. So it isn't captured under this section here. Okay, it's just another piece of equipment. Okay, and as long as it's not thrown, if something is just dropped, if it's just dropped, it's play on, actually. This came up in the Euros. A dude literally just dropped a stick in the, in the circle. It's actually just play on. Definitely not a penalty stroke. Is the helmet coming off similar to dropping a stick? I thought it, yes. A goalkeeper must have a helmet on if they want to use anything. If they, if they want to, ex yeah, if they want to participate in the play, they have to have a helmet on. Like you only allow advantage to go if they are not in danger. So the helmet must be on. Very bad. All speed to you, sir. Thanks for coming by. Uh, if they were wearing all goalkeeper gear other than the headgear, you'd consider them getting an unfair advantage because they were obstructing opponents. Maybe. Uh, oh yeah, right? I mean, and that's what often happens with the goalkeeper's helmet as well. We're so busy watching the ball that we don't know that a goalkeeper's helmet's been dis disheaded. Disinhabited, disinheaded. I want to say both that the helmet has been knocked off either through the goalkeeper's action or through an attacker's action. Okay, so there you go. Kun's watching the high ball as it hits the apex. He immediately draws his eyes down so he can scan the landing zone spot on. Yep, very good. Oh, oh why don't I play the replay so you can all see that. Decision on loose glove spot on play on no disadvantage. Technically, could any player wear hand protection then? Players can technically wear hand protection that fits within the box at any time during the game because it doesn't say that you can only wear the big, the biggest mitts. That's, that's this rule here. Okay, P field players are permitted to wear hand protection that does not increase the natural size of the hand significantly. Any hand protection used both for normal play and to defend penalty corners must fit comfortably without the need of compressing it into this open-ended box. So if they wanted to play with a big, you know, a bigger mitt than what we usually wear, they can, but it's hard. Dislodged, thank you. Hi. Yes, Stefan, I have discussed this. It was New Zealand, Argentina, and it was either in a Hockey World League final or it was a Hockey World Cup or something like that. And yes, we talked about it. If you go through an early What Up Wednesday, this was there. Yep. And a reminder of the importance of what a disengaged umpire watches in a busy D. Absolutely. Love it. Okay. So just a few little reminders that I think are great things to touch base on. And this is one of the reasons why I find watching games as regularly as I do so instructive because you just see more. You see more of the unusual things because you're seeing more of the usual things. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. But there it is. So the last thing that I wanted to touch on. Was Hockey Fives. I went very silent there because I was thinking about what I wanted to say. So the inaugural Hockey Fives event, which I don't know what they meant it to be. They've initially declared it was going to be a Hockey Fives World Cup. Now they're saying the first Hockey World 
Hockey 5 World Cup is going to be in 2023. And I don't know what this was. It was just Hockey 5s. And it was just an invitational, I guess. So the inaugural invitational Hockey 5s was played this weekend. And I watched it. I watched quite a bit of it until the Pro League came on. And then I felt much better. Um, this is in no way to disparage any of the participants. This is, of course, not saying anything about the umpires because you know that I support them wholeheartedly and I want them to enjoy all of their hockey and all of the opportunities. And that's one of the reasons why no umpire would ever come out publicly who's actively looking for FIH appointments and say, well, this was garbage. They're there to serve the game as they are asked, they do what they're asked, and they do it well. End of story. But I watched probably, I don't know, it was a blur, six, seven, eight games, including the men's final and the women's final and matches on the first day. And I think when I called it the TikTok of hockey, on Twitter, that was a bit misleading because that indicated that I didn't think that TikTok was good or fun or entertaining or a great way to fall down a rabbit hole for two hours when you're watching your favorite Gen X comedians. That's not what I'm saying. The problem that I have with that form of the game, that format of the game, is that it's essentially a highlight reel that is on a constant level of hype. There are no dynamics. There are no variations. There are no times. I don't know how many times a commentator said, finally, we can take a breath here. Should that really be your experience of any sport where you don't have an opportunity to take a breath? You want a game to breathe. You want there to be ebbs and flows. If there are no downs, you can't appreciate the ups. And if everything is up here, like I'd watch a game and just go, I don't know what's happened. Every foul is a breakdown foul, but no foul can be called a breakdown foul because they're all happening in a scoring area. They're all happening close to the end. There's no time for umpires to establish a rapport with players, to communicate with players. There's no time for you to even see that they're participating in the game. There's no time for any of that drama to emerge. It's just up here. The music is playing the whole time. Everybody's just running. There's no pauses. There's no nothing. And 20 minutes 20 minutes later, which is how long the game is, you're just, you, you kind of feel like you're from that really old school, what was the speaker company and the, the guy sitting in his armchair and he's like, and he's just getting his hair blown back. I don't want to mess up my hair. So there's nothing wrong with jurisdictions playing this format of the game in order to develop players. We all have come through systems where we've played smaller field games with smaller numbers of players so everybody can get touches on the ball. There's no need for under sixes to be playing 11 a side on a full field. There's no need for under 12s to be playing full size, 11 v 11. But if you are going to have top level competition, it's, this isn't it. This isn't it. And just because a few people walk down the street and they can walk in for free, that doesn't market the game. We have a massive audience of people who play the game, but don't partake in it. Why? Because they don't have clubs to manifest their, in their, their, passions and their fandom into unless they're in the Netherlands or Belgium or Germany and a little bit in England.
but not very much because it's a marketing failure. It's not a sport failure. We don't have to change this format. I don't even know what Radislav said. Let me read it again. It's a killer of our sport. No, at the junior level, it's okay. It's okay because we can develop players like that, but it is not an elite level competition. It's not a World Cup competition. And one of the other big arguments that the administrators use to promote Hockey Fives is this allows teams from smaller nations to compete on the same level. Really? Really? Do you think the Uruguayan women would have won that inaugural event if any of the European teams had been there? Come on. That's not how it works. That's not how sport works. The more players you have in any given area, that is the biggest indicator as to whether you are going to win competitions. Sport is a game of numbers. And just because you remove some of the players off the pitch doesn't mean all of a sudden you don't have 800,000 people playing at home versus 2,000 in Canada. Common sense, people. Radoslav, you have many hockey formats, as you say. Yep. Closer, closer rules to 11. Yeah. Things that keep the game safe are still very important. And that's, you know, the last argument uh, is that with the shooting rules being as they are, they do not promote safety amongst junior players or senior players or anybody. It's not even safe for the umpires out there. And the response from the FIH as well, show us the evidence. It's like, well, first of all, <laughs> you can't gather evidence to a format that's barely been played. We're going to have a lot more of a data set for 11s hockey than we are for this fives, especially when the rules have changed a couple times over the last five years. But we all watch the games. You didn't have to. I watched the games. Did I see anybody getting struck with the ball and suffering a serious injury? Not the games that I watched, but I sure held my breath a lot. Glad you're going to pop in the relay squad, Aline. You're watching. Yes. I watched the men's game and obviously didn't watch the, the women's game because I was doing this. And I actually didn't turn it on. So your full attention is there. So... We'll see what happens, but when the rumors are swirling that this initiative is what may be replacing hockey 11s in the Olympic competitions because the concerns of the IOC over expenses, I don't know how this helps because all you're doing is cutting down on the number of players on the pitch. You still need the same number of officials. You still need the same tech table. You still need an artificial pitch. You need $30,000 boards that are higher than indoor boards circling. You need nets that go up all around the pitch in order to keep it safe because there's no rules against the ball being off the ground, 3D skills. Don't tell me that's cheaper. When you cut out the number of players, what are you doing? You're preserving the administrators and the officials at the expense of the players. And hey, I'm a big fan of umpires, but even I know that that's wrong. Speak out, watch some of the matches yourself. Go to watch.hockey and go back. You can click on the match tab and you can go watch the, the, the games from this weekend. Have a look, see how you feel. Feedback to your national association because if we don't speak out, we're gonna lose, okay? Let's not let that happen. Thanks for joining in. I really enjoyed the show and it was nice to go through so many so many scenarios with you and get all your impact uh all your your points i'm still thinking about your point martin about the the shot a little bit off target so i'm gonna visit that come during the discord so you can talk to me a little bit more about that so we can flush that out fhempires.com forward slash discord and don't forget of course the workshop okay june 16th i'd love to see you there i'm really excited about that subject it's really really fun Oh yeah, and don't forget to hit the like button. That would be really nice as well. We have this. Look, it's animated. Look how cute it is. 
We have many watch parties coming up this weekend for Yellow. We have three coming up and we have our huddles and it's busy, busy, busy in the server. So please come in and join us. I'd love to see you. Thanks for joining in today and we'll see you next week on What If Wednesday. Enjoy your hockey friends and take care of each other.